Following my statement, we are going to do a show on the history of nuclear weapons. This will be a comprehensive history and talk about some very scary things. Be advised, this may not be good for little ears or for people who are currently worried about the state of the world. Can you keep a secret? Changing parts of mind. Changing, 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 This message is transmitted at the request of the United States Office of Civil Defense. The North American Aerospace Defense Command detected three ICBMs launched from North Korea. The first missile is expected to reach the Los Angeles, California area within two hours. The second missile is expected to reach Chicago, Illinois in three hours. The third missile is expected to reach New York City, New York in three and a half hours. Anyone within a 400-mile radius of these cities is at the risk for significant fallout. Anyone, which is most of the United States, in this area needs to seek the nearest fallout shelter. Bring a battery-powered radio, bottled water, canned foods, and other basic survival items. All TV and radio stations in the United States have seized normal programming. President Trump is currently being transported to a secure location and will be speaking soon. The previous was not real. It is a parody audio of the emergency broadcast system announcing the launch of a nuclear intercontinental ballistic missiles from North Korea towards the United States. We live in a world where fear and the chance of massive catastrophic events are a daily headline of the modern 24-hour-a-day news cycle. And although many of our fears are preyed upon by this media, and we are exploited to increase ratings or to manufacture a crisis to affect our world views, elections, and to drive wedges between us to keep us focused on our fears rather than the powers in control, we are still a very fragile world, and we do not have the means to keep ourselves alive when we have the means to wipe ourselves out. Nowhere is this threat of self-destruction so clear than in thermonuclear warfare. Sad to think that science has made advances so great as clean and efficient power that nuclear energy can provide us, but also, however, comes with the great risk and powerful destructive ability that this power is in the hands of those driven to seize or maintain power. When it becomes more than just famous words used by Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer in his eventual realization of the destructive power of nuclear weapons. He knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. Today, on Changing Hearts and Minds, we will go into the history of nuclear weapons and how close the world has come at some times to letting loose this very dangerous energy upon ourselves. This episode is not intended to frighten or to cause panic, but I would be irresponsible not to include the things about nuclear warfare that makes unsettling panic creep into even those who are seemingly fearless. Only two things scare me, and one is nuclear war. What's the other? Excuse me? What's the other thing that scares you? Carnies. What? Circus folk. Nomads, you know. 
Smell like cabbage. Small hands and a pair of wings. Diddle dum dum, diddle dum dum, diddle dum dum. There was a turtle by the name of Bert, and Bert the turtle was very alert. When danger threatened him, he never got hurt. He knew just what to do. He ducked and cover, ducked and cover. He did what we all must learn to do. You and you and you and you. Duck and cover. Be sure and remember what Bert the Turtle just did, friends, because every one of us must remember to do the same thing. That's what this film is all about. Duck and cover. This is an official civil defense film produced in cooperation with the Federal Civil Defense Administration and in consultation with the Safety Commission of the National Education Association. Produced by Archer Productions, Incorporated. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. The Japanese began the war from the air at Pearl Harbor. They have been repaid many fold, and the end is not yet. With this bomb, we have now added a new and revolutionary increase in destruction to supplement the growing power of our armed forces. In their present form, these bombs are now in production, and even more powerful forms are in development. It is an atomic bomb. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. The force from which the sun draws his power has been loosed against those who brought war to the Far East. We have spent more than two billion dollars on the greatest scientific gamble in history, and we have won. But the greatest marvel is not the size of the enterprise, its secrecy, or its cost, but the achievement of scientific brains in making it work. In all of recorded history to this very day, the only country to ever use a nuclear weapon in combat is the United States. It's just the bottom line. Uh, we stand in judgment of so many other countries, yet we're the only ones who've actually used a weapon. Now, I'm not going to say that using a nuclear weapon was right or wrong. It was the end of World War II. Uh, the amount of people that were going to die sh had we invaded mainland Japan was going to be astronomical. We were concerned that there were countries that were also pursuing the atomic bomb that were going to catch up with us and get their hands on it first. We needed to establish dominance, if you will, early and get that nuclear weapon into existence and to be tested. Now, whether or not we should have used it against the Japanese in an offensive tactic and not maybe given them a warning and showed them what we had first, that's up to debate that I won't get into. But I will say that 1945... August 6th and August 9th were not the beginning of the drive to create nuclear weapons. In 1933, there was a Hungarian-American physicist named Leo Slizard, who in walking across the street in London, actually came up with the idea, nuclear chain reactions, and he patented this idea in the, the guise of a nuclear weapon in 1934 under British patent number 630726. World War II is at its height. The Nazis are actually just... They've started their own nuclear weapons program, which prompted the United States to start its own nuclear weapons program. It was, I believe, 1942? Yes, 1942, University of California at Berkeley, there was a physicist named J. Robert Oppenheimer, and he was put in charge, along with a general from the United States military, of a project called the Manhattan Project. And the Manhattan Project's plan and their end state was to put together a nuclear weapon. Uh, hopefully they would get this done before the Germans did because the Germans were well on their way. As we know, German technology during, the, during World War II is very, very advanced. They were technologically much better than the United States at pretty much everything except for getting to the actual nuclear bomb before us. In a kind of an odd, bad turn of events, the Japanese actually took a look at nuclear fission and nuclear bombs and had come to the decision that 
although it was feasible, it was highly unlikely that anyone was going to be able to put together a nuclear bomb. So they, cha- they put all of their efforts and research into radar research. Now, hindsight being 2020, we all know that that might have been a really poor choice by the Japanese to uh, think that nuclear weapons were not possible. The Russians, on the other hand, had also found out that we were pursuing the nuclear weapon, and they started their own nuclear program also. Uh, they had received, uh, history says that Stalin received a letter from some physicist telling him that the United States was looking into nuclear weapons, and therefore he decided he was going to start his own nuclear program. Now, after a few years of research by the Manhattan Project, which actually was broken down into two phases, uh, phase, the first phase was actually all the testing that was done at a place called Site-X, which was in Tennessee and is now known as the Oak Ridge National Laboratories. They enriched their, their uranium up in Washington State, and actually they did most of their second stage putting together of the bomb at what was called Site-Y which Site Y was located in New Mexico at what is now known the Los Alamos National Laboratory. The date of that trip was November 16, 1942. Uh, This cold afternoon with the boys and their masters out in their shorts playing ball in the fields with a a light snowstorm going on. It was a rather striking scene, which I well remember. General Groves immediately said, this is a suitable site. And the, uh, the legal processes for acquiring it were initiated immediately. I think the very same day or the very next day. And construction started in December. Well, things moved very fast. So that was the beginning of Los Alamos. The Alamogordo bombing and gunnery range, which was 230 miles south of Los Alamos, Los Alamos is most famous for its landmark role as the birthplace of nuclear weapons. Uh, There was this device called Jumbo, which was one unique device that appeared at the Trinity site in the days leading up to the test. Uh, Jumbo was a massive cylindrical steel container. Its production was ordered at a cost of $12 million by General Leslie Groves as a containment vessel. So this vessel, this actually was the vessel that contained the nuclear weapon itself. Anything, but when the explosion went off the, uh, that welding glass, seemed to just glow white, just intense white like the sun. And so it just blinded me. And so I looked aside to the left. The Oscuro Mountains were at the left, and they were just lit up like daylight then. So I looked at that for a few seconds, and then I looked back at through my welding glass, and I saw that the terrific explosion had taken place. On July 16th at 5.45 a.m., the entire world changed because that was the day that nuclear weapons became a reality. The Trinity test was a success, dropping the first uh, nuclear weapon or detonating the first nuclear weapon in New Mexico, way out in the middle of nowhere. And it wasn't more than a month later that the very first nuclear explosion in combat, which was called Little Boy, which was a gun-type uranium-235 weapon, was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan by the Enola Gay, which is a bomber. Uh, August 9th, not more than a few days later, a Fat Man, codenamed Fat Man, which was an implosive type plutonium 239 weapon, was dropped on Nagasaki, Japan. And it didn't take very long after that, it was actually late August 1945, that Jura- Japan unconditionally surrendered to the Allied powers al- aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Harbor. Crowds gather in front of the White House awaiting the announcement of Japan's surrender from President Harry S. Truman. It took two atomic bombs to bring Japan to her knees. But now Pearl Harbor was avenged and the news triggered the greatest celebration the nation has ever known. 66,000 people died in the bombing at Hiroshima. 34,000 people died at the bombing of Nagasaki. J. Robert Oppenheimer had mixed emotions to begin with about the nuclear weapon. He did what he had to do to end the war, and he said that he had no doubt that everyone involved in the project had good intent. But he had also advised the United States to make sure that they let the Soviets know ahead of time that they were going to drop this weapon. That was completely ignored. And so what that did was, in my opinion, was it created a little bit of a distrust, which already existed on some level, of the Soviets against the United States, because the British were kept in informed, but the Soviets were not. So therefore, the Soviets felt like there was probably a need now, a very big need for them to rush into creating their own nuclear weapon. 
this unfortunately would lead to probably the largest arms race with the most destructive power and the it also led to words like mutually assured destruction doomsday clock and led to an event in 19 in the 1960s in october and november that would utterly change the atmosphere of the entire world although the cold war was raging pretty good by that point nobody could foresee what was going to happen just south of florida in the early 60s at a little island called cuba now, before we go any further, to understand nuclear weapons, you kind of have to understand the difference between fission bombs and fusion bombs. So a fission bomb was what we started out with. The United States, 1945, the Trinity test was a fission bomb. And what a fission bomb is, also known as an atomic bomb or an A-bomb, which has the equivalent of 500 kilotons. So just understand, that's 500 kilotons of TNT. It's a pretty large boom, obviously. 500 kilotons of TNT was enough to destroy and level Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But a fission bomb works by splitting an atom, which then causes a, nu a nuclear chain reaction, which causes neutrons to be released, causing another atom to split, and so on and so forth. The problem with fission bombs, as far as being sustainable chain reaction, is by the time you get done with the, the reaction, there's a lot of the nuclear material that is not used and not spent. The United States has its first fission bomb, the A-bomb, which is dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the Trinity test. And immediately from that point forward, there is a giant race to try to get your hands on nuclear weapons by all these different countries. And in 1949, the Soviet Union, it tested its first fission bomb, which was nicknamed Joe One by the U.S. And so 1949, now the United States and the USSR both have nuclear weapons and the war is on. Then comes fusion bombs. Now, if the difference between a fission bomb and a fusion bomb is a fusion bomb and heats up to a lot higher, you know, hotter of a, of a reaction, which causes a thermonuclear explosion rather than just a fission bomb explosion, this is also called a hydrogen or an H-bomb. Now, just so you know the difference, the very first hydrogen bomb that was ever detonated by the United States, which was called Ivy Mike in 1952, was 38 megatons of TNT. So just so you understand the difference, 500 kilotons, kilotons with a K, is a fission bomb. The hydrogen bomb was 38 megatons of TNT. That in and of itself was the entire amount of ordnance, explosive ordnance used in World War II times 10, including the two A-bombs that were dropped in World War II. That's how big this thing was. So the USSR keeping with us goes and creates their own hydrogen bomb, which was nicknamed Joe 4 by the U.S., and that was 1953 they detonated that. But they didn't just stop with that. See, in 1961, a thing called the Tsar Bomba, or the Tsar Bomb, was dropped and tested by the, by the Soviet Union. They detonated a 60 megaton bomb. This thing would have had a fireball maybe 10 miles across. A fireball? and must have destroyed hundreds and hundreds of miles of Siberia where it was tested by dropping it from a plane. It was the most powerful nuclear device ever detonated in the entire world. It was 58 megatons of TNT and it was detonated above the ground in an island in the Arctic Ocean. It's really difficult to really get people to understand this but the, the impact, the, the shock wave of the explosion was felt around the world three times. So it went around the world, was measured again as it passed by the location three separate times before it finally dissipated out. It actually scared the Soviets that it, w it was so big. And I don't think, and most scientists don't believe, that, the, that, the, that humanity will ever, ever detonate a bomb that large again. It wasn't long after that that different treaties were signed saying that there will be no more testing of airburst nuclear weapons, underwater nuclear weapons, or weapons detonated in space. All that came about not too soon after this Tsar Bomba was detonated, the largest explosion ever created on Earth by man. You have China starting to get into the act. Uh, China would supply uranium to the Soviet Union. In, 1960, in 1951, France successfully tested a nuclear weapon in 1960. Uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency is founded in 1957 and China successfully tested an atomic bomb at Loop Noor in 1964. And then 1967, not too long after, China then had itself a hydrogen bomb also. 
So the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is signed in 1968 and it was opened up for signatures then. The treaty is intended to limit the spread of nuclear weapons. To date, 189 countries have signed the treaty, including the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. Only India, Israel, Pakistan, and North Korea have not signed the treaty, and those are as sovereign states. There are non-sovereign states that haven't signed it either, but most of them do not have, actually none of them, have any nuclear capability as we know it. India tested its first nuclear bomb in 1974, called the Smiling Buddha, and Pakistan's atomic program was launched by Zulfikar al Bhutto, uh, making the Pakistani Islamic State the only Islamic State to have nuclear weapons. And I think, if I remember correctly, the reason why India has nuclear weapons is because Pakistan has nuclear weapons, and it's intended to keep those two in a mutually assured destructive situation so that they don't destroy each other. But let's talk about what happened in the 1960s that really scared the hell out of the entire world and may have been the closest we have ever come to actual nuclear holocaust. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. Upon receiving the first preliminary hard information of this nature, last Tuesday morning at 9 a.m., I directed that our surveillance be stepped up. And having now confirmed and completed our evaluation of the evidence, and our decision on a course of action, this government feels obliged to report this new crisis to you in fullest detail. The characteristic of these new missile sites indicate two distinct types of installations. Several of them include medium range ballistic missiles capable of carrying a nuclear warhead for a distance of more than 1,000 nautical miles. Each of these missiles, in short, is capable of striking Washington, D.C., the Panama Canal, Cape Canaveral, Mexico City, or any other city in the southeastern part of the United States. The Cuban Missile Crisis, which was also known as the October Crisis, or the Caribbean Crisis, or the Missile Scare, was a 13-day confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union concerning American ballistic missile deployment in Italy and Turkey with a consequent Soviet ballistic missile deployment into Cuba. The confrontation is often considered the coldest the cold water came and almost escalated to a full-scale nuclear war. In response to the failed Bay of Pigs invasion of 1961 and the presence of the American Jupiter ballistic missiles in Italy and Turkey, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev decided to agree to Cuba's request to place nuclear weapons on the island to deter American invasion. The problem was they were offensive weapons, not defensive. An agreement was reached during a secret military meeting between Khrushchev and Fidel Castro in July of 1962, and construction of a number of missile launch facilities started later that very same summer. In 1962, the United States elections were underway, and the White House had, de had denied charges that it was ignoring dangerous Soviet missiles 90 miles from Florida. The missile preparations were confirmed when an Air Force U-2 spy plane produced clear photographic evidence of a medium-range SS-4 and immediate-range R-14 ballistic missile facility. The U.S. established a military blockade to prevent further missiles from reaching Cuba. The Oval Office tapes during the crisis revealed that Kennedy had also put the blockade in place in an attempt to revoke the Soviet-backed forces into Berlin as well. It announced that they would not permit offensive weapons to be delivered to Cuba and demanded that the weapons already in Cuba be dismantled and returned to the Soviet Union. After a long period of tense negotiations, an agreement was reached between the U.S. President John F. Kennedy and Khrushchev. Publicly, the Soviets would dismantle their offensive weapons in Cuba and return them back to the Soviet Union, subject to United Nations verification, in exchange for a U.S. public declaration and agreement to avoid invading Cuba again. Secretly, the United States also agreed that it would dismantle all U.S.-built Jupiter missiles that had been placed in Turkey. When all defensive missiles had been withdrawn from Cuba, the blockade was formally ended, and that ended on November 21st, 1962. The negotiations between the United States and the Soviet Union pointed out the necessity of a quick, clear, and direct communication line between Washington and Moscow. As a result, 
the Moscow Washington Hotline was established, which was a series of agreements that were set up to reduce U.S. and Soviet tensions for several years, may have stopped the entire world from a Holocaust. From the point of view of the United States, John F. Kennedy's administration, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Cuban Missile Crisis was nothing more than an attempt by the Soviet Union to expand its power and to be the bad guy. But I think sometimes we forget that you have to look at everything from the different points of view of the people involved. The following is the son of Nikolai Khrushchev, Sergei Khrushchev, talking about his view and his father's actions from the Soviet perspective of the Cuban Missile Crisis. In the American history, we present the Cuban Missile Crisis as the clash of the superpowers and changing balance of power. And uh, it was impossible to change balance of power in this way, because American superiority was too big. America at that time has 159 ICBM and about 2,500 strategic bombers that could attack Soviet Union. Soviet Union had only 24 ICBM. So would you add 50 uh, missiles in Cuba, it will not change. Each great power have their obligation to protect all their allies. They're far or close, they're important or they're not important. And when Castro, after the Bay of Pigs, declared officially that he joined the Soviet bloc, he put this obligation on the, my father's shoulders. And through this, the Cuba became to the Soviet Union the same as the West Berlin to the United States. Useless small piece of land, very deep inside hostile territory. But if you will not protect uh, the, uh, the small piece of land, you will lose your face. Your allies would not trust you. So we have to do it. So Khrushchev decided to send missiles there at the diplomatic signal. Don't invade Cuba, we are serious. He did not understood at that time that American mentality is different. For Europeans, Soviets, all their history had enemies at the gate. So additional American missiles or Italy or Turkey did not change more. They only replaced Germans' armies and Germans army replaced Napoleon armies or uh, Austro-Hungarian armies or Turkish armies. For Americans, each such threat was like a shock. And here, because it was the psychological crisis, Americans thought that it is the end of the world. They tried to bring all this food on the shelters, waiting until it will be this apocalypse. For the Soviet Union, it was one of the crises, because we lived through the two Berlin crises, three Middle East crises, Far East crises. So it was no panic on the Soviets. It was, uh, we have this feeling that we have to protect Cuba. It can be war, but it was no panic. Nobody left the Moscow for big cities. Nobody buy food. It was life as usual. With the Soviet boats turned back around and the Cuban Missile Crisis averted, we would have no idea how many times over the years we had actually just barely missed nuclear annihilation. Another example of this is September 26, 1983, which was just three weeks after the Soviet military had shot down Korean Airlines Flight 007. A Soviet, Lieutenant Stasinlov Yagredovich Petrov, was a duty officer at the command center for the OKU nuclear early warning system when the system suddenly reported that a missile had been launched from the United States, followed by up to five more. It was completely unexpected, as such things usually are. The siren sounded very loudly, and I just sat there for a few seconds, staring at the screen with the word LAUNCH, displayed in bold red letters. A minute later, this siren went off again. The second missile was launched, then the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. The computers changed their alerts from launch to missile strike. There were no rules about how long we were allowed to think before we reported a strike. But we knew that every second of delay took away valuable time that the Soviet Union's military and political leadership needed. And then I made my decision. 
I would not trust the computer. I picked up the telephone handset, spoke to my superiors and reported that the alarm was false. But I, myself, was not sure until the very last moment. I knew perfectly well that nobody would be able to correct my mistake if I had made one. Petrov judged the reports to be a false alarm, and his decision is credited with having prevented an erroneous retaliatory nuclear attack on the United States and its NATO allies that most certainly would have resulted in a large-scale nuclear war. Investigations later confirmed that the Soviet satellite warning systems had indeed malfunctioned, and they were actually picking up sunlight that was bouncing off of clouds. In 1991, the Soviet Union finally fell, leaving a vacuum of power in the, in the USSR. Repeating once again our top story, Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev has been removed from power, and there are tanks now in the streets of Moscow. Vice President Gennady Yanayev says he has taken over as acting president as the head of state of a special state committee. You're watching live pictures from Moscow this morning. He has declared a state of emergency in individual localities. It is not clear what that means. Russian President Boris Yeltsin says the action is illegal, and he's called for a general strike to return Mr. Gorbachev to office. A spokesman for Boris Yeltsin says Mr. Gorbachev... I don't remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. I don't remember what was going on in 1983, but I do remember what I was doing in 1991. I think I was home from school because it was a snow day or something in New Jersey, and immediately on the news, reports that a coup or a overthrow of the USSR had happened. With the Cold War pretty much over, you would think that the threat of nuclear weapons had gone away, but it didn't. There was a lot of accountability issues that Soviet Union had after the war. Trying to maintain accountability of all the different nuclear weapons that were out there was a struggle for the international community and the UN as to what was happening to all these nuclear weapons. The United States, there's like the post, the pre-9-11 world and there's the post-9-11 world. Things will never be the same. Things will never go back to the way they were pre-9-11. I mean, TSA didn't exist pre-9-11. Closed bases really didn't exist pre-9-11. Post-9-11 world is a much different place. It's a much different world. As soon as we enter in the world of nuclear war, the world will never look the same again, ever. We'll never be able to turn the wheels back and go back to a life into a world before it. And that scares the shit out of me. We live in a post-9-11 world now. And as Eddie said, it's very scary to think that these kind of weapon systems are out there. And also, to think that they could get into the hands of non-government authorities like terrorism. But there are still countries out there that are still trying to get their hands on nuclear weapons. I mean, in 1998, both India and Pakistan were still detonating and testing nuclear weapons. And in 2003, North Korea announced that it had several nuclear explosives. Now, they thought they were getting away with something, but for years they had kind of known that North Korea had these. In August of 2005, the Ayatollah al Khomeini issued a fatwa forbidding the production stockpiling of use of nuclear weapons. Yet Iran has also been known to be trying to find their way to a nuclear weapon. This is probably being monitored very closely by nations such as Israel. But the fact that North Korea and Iran are on their way to building nuclear weapons, but all you got to do, guys, is turn the news on nowadays and you will see non-stop news coverage of North Korea, nuclear weapons, and it seems like we're right back in the same place that we were at in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, where we had a, war, a world where we were sitting around waiting for when the, uh, the alarms are going to go off and when the nuclear bomb was going to drop. We can only pray that common sense will overwhel overwhelm everybody and that people won't be shooting nuclear weapons at each other because mutually assured destruction is not just a term. It is a damn fact when it comes to nuclear weapons. We can only hope that for the nations out there that have nuclear weapons, including the United States, that we never get to the point where we actually have to launch one of these things against one of our enemies or have them launched against us. There really is no good end to any kind of nuclear warfare. And although anybody that's been to war and most people who are just common sense and can turn on the TV and watch media can tell you, war never really is a good answer to everything. Although you will find me telling people that violence does solve problems and there are times where you have to stand up to bullies and defend yourself, nuclear weapons I don't think are really the answer. 
and nuclear weapons will really do nothing but cause more problems than they'll solve. They're a very dangerous, very destructive, and a very scary thing because they're the one thing that really can lead to the extinction of our race, really. Stay safe out there, guys. Don't oppress your minds. Free the oppressed, and we will see you guys next week. Change your POV and all of it shows can help and heal and even educate. We want you to help us help others. Visit our Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash change your POV. Become a patron of our network and our mission.